Chapter 5. Lesson 5. The Rich Invent Money. Often in the real world, it's not the smart who get ahead, but the bold. Last night, I took a break from writing and watched a TV program on the history of a young man named Alexander Graham Bell. Bell had just patented his telephone and was having growing pains because the demand for his new invention was so strong. Needing a bigger company, he then went to the giant at that time, Western Union, and asked them if they would buy his patent and his tiny company. He wanted $100,000 for the whole package. The president of Western Union scoffed at him and turned him down, saying the price was ridiculous. The rest is history. A multi-billion dollar industry emerged, and AT&T was born. The evening news came on right after the story of Alexander Graham Bell. On the news was a story of another downsizing at a local company. The workers were angry and complained that the company ownership was unfair. A terminated manager of about 45 years of age had his wife and two babies at the plant and was begging the guards to let him talk to the owners to ask if they would reconsider his termination. He had just bought a house and was afraid of losing it. The camera focused in on his pleading for all the world to see. Needless to say, it held my attention. I have been teaching professionally since 1984. It has been a great experience and a rewarding one. It is also a disturbing profession, for I have taught thousands of individuals, and I see one thing in common in all of us, myself included. We all have tremendous potential, and we all are blessed with gifts. Yet the one thing that holds all of us back is some degree of self-doubt. It is not so much the lack of technical information that holds us back, but more the lack of self-confidence. Some are more affected than others. Once we leave school, most of us know that it is not so much a matter of college degrees or good grades that count. In the real world, outside of academics, something more than just grades is required. I have heard it called many things. Guts, chutzpah, balls, audacity, bravado, cunning, daring, tenacity, and brilliance. This factor, whatever it is labeled, ultimately decides one's future much more than school grades do. Inside each of us is one of these brave, brilliant, and daring characters. There is also the flip side of that character, people who could get down on their knees and beg if necessary. After a year in Vietnam as a Marine Corps pilot, I got to know both of those characters inside of me intimately. One is not better than the other. Yet, as a teacher, I recognized that it was excessive fear and self-doubt that were the greatest detractors of personal genius. It broke my heart to see students know the answers, yet lack the courage to act on the answer. Often, in the real world, it's not the smart who get ahead, but the bold. In my personal experience, your financial genius requires both technical knowledge as well as courage. If fear is too strong, the genius is suppressed. In my classes, I strongly urge students to learn to take risks, to be bold, and to let their genius convert that fear into power and brilliance. It works for some and just terrifies others. I have come to realize that for most people, when it comes to the subject of money, they would rather play it safe. I have had to field questions such as, why take risks? Why should I bother developing my financial IQ? Why should I become financially literate? And I answer, just to have more options. There are huge changes up ahead. In the coming years, there will be more people just like the young inventor Alexander Graham Bell. There will be a hundred people like Bill Gates and hugely successful companies like Microsoft created every year all over the world. And there will also be many more bankruptcies, layoffs, and downsizings. So why bother developing your financial IQ? No one can answer that but you. Yet I can tell you why I myself do it. I do it because it is the most exciting time to be alive. I'd rather be welcoming change than dreading change. 
I'd rather be excited about making millions than worrying about not getting a raise. This period we are in now is a most exciting time, unprecedented in our world's history. Generations from now, people will look back at this period of time and remark at what an exciting era it must have been. It was the death of the old and birth of the new. It was full of turmoil, and it was exciting. So why bother developing your financial IQ? Because if you do, you will prosper greatly. And if you don't, this period of time will be a frightening one. It will be a time of watching some people move boldly forward while others cling to worn-out life preservers. Land was wealth 300 years ago, so the person who owned the land owned the wealth. Later, wealth was in factories and production, and America rose to dominance. The industrialist owned the wealth. Today, wealth is in information, and the person who has the most timely information owns the wealth. The problem is that information flies around the world at the speed of light. The new wealth cannot be contained by boundaries and borders as land and factories were. The changes will be faster and more dramatic. There will be a dramatic increase in the number of new multimillionaires. There also will be those who are left behind. I find so many people struggling today, often working harder, simply because they cling to old ideas. They want things to be the way they were, and they resist change. I know people who are losing their jobs or their houses, and they blame technology or the economy or their boss. Sadly, they fail to realize that they might be the problem. Old ideas are their biggest liability. It is a liability simply because they fail to realize that while that idea or way of doing something was an asset yesterday, yesterday is gone. One afternoon, I was teaching how to invest using a board game I had invented, Cash Flow, as a teaching tool. A friend had brought someone along to attend the class. This friend of a friend was recently divorced, had been badly burned in the divorce settlement, and was now searching for some answers. Her friend thought the class might help. The game was designed to help people learn how money works. In playing the game, they learn about the interaction of the income statement with the balance sheet. They learn how cash flows between the two and how the road to wealth is through striving to increase your monthly cash flow from the asset column to the point that it exceeds your monthly expenses. Once you accomplish this, you are able to get out of the rat race and out onto the fast track. As I have said, some people hate the game. Some love it, and others miss the point. This woman missed a valuable opportunity to learn something. In the opening round, she drew a doodad card with the boat on it. At first, she was happy. Oh, I've got a boat. Then, as her friend tried to explain how the numbers worked on her income statement and balance sheet, she got frustrated because she had never liked math. The rest of her table waited while her friend continued explaining the relationship between the income statement, balance sheet, and monthly cash flow. Suddenly, when she realized how the numbers worked, it dawned on her that her boat was eating her alive. Later on in the game, she was also downsized and had a child. It was a horrible game for her. After the class, her friend came by and told me that she was upset. She had come to the class to learn about investing and did not like the idea that it took so long to play a silly game. Her friend attempted to tell her to look within herself to see if the game reflected her in any way. With that suggestion, the woman demanded her money back. She said that the very idea that a game could be a reflection of her was ridiculous. Her money was promptly refunded, and she left. Since 1984, I have made millions simply by doing what the school system does not do. In school, most teachers lecture. I hated lectures as a student. I was soon bored, and my mind would drift. In 1984, I began teaching via games and simulations, and I still rely on these tools today. I always encourage adult students to look at games as reflecting back to them what they know and what they need to learn. 
Most importantly, games reflect behavior. They are instant feedback systems. Instead of the teacher lecturing you, the game is giving you a personalized lecture, one that is custom made just for you. The friend of the woman who left later called to give me an update. She said her friend was fine and had calmed down. In her cooling off period, she could see some slight relationship between the game and her life. Although she and her husband did not own a boat, they did own everything else imaginable. She was angry after their divorce, both because he had run off with a younger woman and because, after 20 years of marriage, they had accumulated little in the way of assets. There was virtually nothing for them to split. Their 20 years of married life had been incredible fun, but all they had accumulated was a ton of doodads. She realized that her anger at doing the numbers, the income statement and balance sheet, came from her embarrassment about not understanding them. She believed that finances were the man's job. She maintained the house and did the entertaining, and he handled the finances. She was now quite certain that in the last five years of their marriage, he had hidden money from her. She was angry at herself for not being more aware of where the money was going, as well as for not knowing about the other woman. Just like a board game, the world is always providing us with instant feedback. We could learn a lot if we tuned in more. One day, not long ago, I complained to my wife that the cleaners must have shrunk my pants. My wife gently smiled and poked me in the stomach to inform me that the pants had not shrunk. Something else had expanded. Me. The cash flow game was designed to give every player personal feedback. Its purpose is to give you options. If you draw the boat card and it puts you into debt, the question is, now what can you do? How many different financial options can you come up with? That is the purpose of the game, to teach players to think and create new and various financial options. Thousands of people throughout the world have played this game. The players who get out of the rat race the quickest are the people who understand numbers and have creative financial minds. They recognize different financial options. Rich people are often creative and take calculated risks. People who take the longest are people who are not familiar with numbers and often do not understand the power of investing. Some people playing cash flow gain lots of money in the game, but they don't know what to do with it. Even though they have money, everyone else seems to be getting ahead of them. And that is true in real life. There are a lot of people who have a lot of money and do not get ahead financially. Limiting your options is the same as hanging on to old ideas. I have a friend from high school who now works at three jobs. Years ago, he was the richest of all my classmates. When the local sugar plantation closed, the company he worked for went down with the plantation. In his mind, he had but one option, and that was the old option, work hard. The problem was that he couldn't find an equivalent job that recognized his seniority from the old company. As a result, he is overqualified for the jobs he currently has, so his salary is lower. He now works three jobs to earn enough to survive. I have watched people playing cash flow complain that the right opportunity cards are not coming their way, so they sit there. I know people who do that in real life. They wait for the right opportunity. I have watched people get the right opportunity card and then not have enough money. Then they complain that they would have gotten out of the rat race if they had had more money. So they sit there. I know people in real life who do that also. They see all the great deals, but they have no money. And I have seen people pull a great opportunity card, read it out loud, and have no idea that it is a great opportunity. They have the money, the time is right, they have the card, but they can't see the opportunity staring them in the face. They fail to see how it fits into their financial plan for escaping the rat race. And I know more people like that than all the others combined. Most people have an opportunity of a lifetime flash right in front of them, and they fail to see it. A year later, they find out about it, after everyone else got rich. 
financial intelligence is simply having more options. If the opportunities aren't coming your way, what else can you do to improve your financial position? If an opportunity lands in your lap and you have no money and the bank won't talk to you, what else can you do to get the opportunity to work in your favor? If your hunch is wrong and what you've been counting on doesn't happen, how can you turn a lemon into millions? That is financial intelligence. It is not so much what happens, but how many different financial solutions you can think of to turn a lemon into millions. It is how creative you are in solving financial problems. Most people only know one solution work hard, save, and borrow. So, why would you want to increase your financial intelligence? Because you want to be the kind of person who creates your own luck. You take whatever happens and make it better. Few people realize that luck is created just as money is. And if you want to be luckier and create money instead of working hard, then your financial intelligence is important. If you are the kind of person who is waiting for the right thing to happen, you might wait for a long time. It's like waiting for all the traffic lights to be green for five miles before you'll start your trip. As young boys, Mike and I were constantly told by my rich dad that money is not real. Rich Dad occasionally reminded us of how close we came to the secret of money on that first day we got together and began making money out of plaster of Paris. The poor and middle class work for money, he would say. The rich make money. The more real you think money is, the harder you will work for it. If you can grasp the idea that money is not real, you will grow richer faster. What is it? was a question Mike and I often came back with. What is money if it is not real? What we agree it is, was all Rich Dad would say. The single most powerful asset we all have is our mind. If it is trained well, it can create enormous wealth seemingly instantaneously. An untrained mind can also create extreme poverty that can crush a family for generations. In the information age, money is increasing exponentially. A few individuals are getting ridiculously rich from nothing, just ideas and agreements. If you ask many people who trade stocks or other investments for a living, they see it done all the time. Often, millions can be made instantaneously from nothing. And by nothing, I mean no money was exchanged. It is done via agreement, a hand signal in a trading pit, a blip on a trader's screen in Lisbon from a trader's screen in Toronto and back to Lisbon, a call to my broker to buy and a moment later to sell. Money did not change hands. Agreements did. So why develop your financial genius? Only you can answer that. I can tell you why I have been developing this area of my intelligence. I do it because I want to make money fast, not because I need to, but because I want to. It is a fascinating learning process. I develop my financial IQ because I want to participate in the fastest game and biggest game in the world. And, in my own small way, I would like to be part of this unprecedented evolution of humanity, the era where humans work purely with their minds and not with their bodies. Besides, it is where the action is. It is what is happening. It's hip. It's scary, and it's fun. That is why I invest in my financial intelligence, developing the most powerful asset I have. I want to be with people moving boldly forward. I do not want to be with those left behind. I will give you a simple example of creating money. In the early 1990s, the economy of Phoenix, Arizona was horrible. I was watching a TV show when a financial planner came on and began forecasting doom and gloom. His advice was to save money. Put $100 away every month, he said. In 40 years, you will be a multimillionaire. Well, putting money away every month is a sound idea. It is one option, the option most people subscribe to. The problem is this. It blinds the person to what is really going on. It causes them to miss major opportunities for much more significant growth of their money. 
the world is passing them by. As I said, the economy was terrible at that time. For investors, this is the perfect market condition. A chunk of my money was in the stock market and in apartment houses. I was short of cash. Because people were giving properties away, I was buying. I was not saving money. I was investing. Kim and I had more than a million dollars in cash working in a market that was rising fast. It was the best opportunity to invest. The economy was terrible. I just could not pass up these small deals. Houses that were once $100,000 were now $75,000. But instead of shopping with local real estate agents, I began shopping at the bankruptcy attorney's office or the courthouse steps. In these shopping places, a $75,000 house could sometimes be bought for $20,000 or less. For $2,000, which was loaned to me from a friend for 90 days for $200, I gave an attorney a cashier's check as a down payment. While the acquisition was being processed, I ran an ad advertising a $75,000 house for only $60,000 and no money down. The phone rang hard and heavy. Prospective buyers were screened, and once the property was legally mine, all the prospective buyers were allowed to look at the house. It was a feeding frenzy. The house sold in a few minutes. I asked for a $2,500 processing fee, which they gladly handed over, and the escrow and title company took over from there. I returned the $2,000 to my friend with an additional $200. He was happy, the home buyer was happy, the attorney was happy, and I was happy. I had sold a house for $60,000 that cost me $20,000. The $40,000 was created for money in my asset column in the form of a promissory note from the buyer. Total working time? Five hours. So, now that you are on your way to becoming more financially literate and skilled at reading numbers, I will tell you why this is an example of money being invented. During this depressed market, Kim and I were able to do six of these simple transactions in our spare time. While the bulk of our money was in larger properties and the stock market, we were able to create more than $190,000 in assets notes at 10% interest, in those six buy, create, and sell transactions. That comes to approximately $19,000 a year income, much of it sheltered through our private corporation. Much of that $19,000 a year goes to pay for our company cars, gas, trips, insurance, dinners with clients, and other things. By the time the government gets a chance to tax that income, it's been spent on legally allowed pre-tax expenses. This was a simple example of how money is invented, created, and protected using financial intelligence. Ask yourself, how long would it take to save $190,000? Would the bank pay you 10% interest on your money? And the promissory note is good for 30 years. I hope they never pay me the $190,000. I have to pay a tax if they pay me the principal, and besides, $19,000 paid over 30 years is a little over $500,000 in income. I have people ask, what happens if the person doesn't pay? That does happen, and it's good news. That $60,000 home could be taken back and resold for $70,000 and another $2,500 collected as a loan processing fee. It would still be a zero-down transaction in the mind of the new buyer, and the process would go on. The first time I sold the house, I paid back the $2,000, so technically I have no money in the transaction. My return on investment... ROI is infinity. It's an example of no money making a lot of money. In the second transaction, when resold, I would have put $2,000 in my pocket and re-extended the loan to 30 years. What would my ROI be if I got paid money to make money? I do not know, but it sure beats saving $100 a month, which actually starts out as $150 because it's after-tax income for 40 years earning low interest. And again, you're taxed on the interest. That is not too intelligent. 
It may be safe, but it's not smart. A few years later, as the Phoenix real estate market strengthened, those houses we sold for $60,000 became worth $110,000. Foreclosure opportunities were still available, but became rare. It cost a valuable asset, my time, to go out looking for them. Thousands of buyers were looking for the few available deals. The market had changed. It was time to move on and look for other opportunities to put in the asset column. You cannot do that here. That is against the law. You're lying. I hear those comments much more often than, Can you show me how to do that? The math is simple. You do not need algebra or calculus. And the escrow company handles the legal transaction and the servicing of the payments. I have no roofs to fix or toilets to unplug because the owners do that. It's their house. Occasionally, someone does not pay, and that is wonderful because there are late fees, or they move out and the property is sold again. The court system handles that. And it may not work in your area. The market conditions may be different, but the example illustrates how a simple financial process can create hundreds of thousands of dollars with little money and low risk. It is an example of money being only an agreement. Anyone with a high school education can do it, yet most people won't. Most people listen to the standard advice of work hard and save money. For about 30 hours of work, approximately $190,000 was created in the asset column, and no taxes were paid. Which one sounds harder to you? 1. Work hard, pay 50% in taxes, save what is left, your savings then earn 5%, which is also taxed. Or... 2. Take the time to develop your financial intelligence, harness the power of your brain and the asset column. If you use option number 1, be sure to factor in how much time it takes you to save $190,000. Time is one of your greatest assets. Now, you may understand why I silently shake my head when I hear parents say, my child is doing well in school and receiving a good education. It may be good, but is it adequate? I know the above investment strategy is a small one. It is used to illustrate how small can grow into big. Again, my success reflects the importance of a strong financial foundation, which starts with a strong financial education. I have said it before, but it's worth repeating. Financial intelligence is made up of these four main technical skills. 1. Accounting. Accounting is financial literacy, or the ability to read numbers. This is a vital skill if you want to build businesses or investments. 2. Investing. Investing is the science of money making money. 3. Understanding markets. Understanding markets is the science of supply and demand. Alexander Graham Bell gave the market what it wanted. So did Bill Gates. A $75,000 house offered for $60,000 that cost $20,000 was also the result of seizing an opportunity created by the market. Somebody was buying, and someone was selling. 4. The Law The law is the awareness of accounting, corporate, state, and federal regulations. I recommend playing by the rules. It is this basic foundation, or the combination of these skills, that is needed to be successful in the pursuit of wealth, whether it be through the buying of small homes, apartment buildings, companies, stocks, bonds, precious metals, baseball cards, or the like. A few years later, the real estate market rebounded and everyone else was getting in. The stock market was booming and everyone was getting in. The U.S. economy was getting back on its feet. I began selling and was now traveling to Peru, Norway, Malaysia, and the Philippines. The investment landscape had changed. We were no longer buying real estate. 
Now, I just watched the values climb inside the asset column and will probably begin selling. I suspect that some of those six little house deals will sell and the $40,000 note will be converted to cash. I need to call my accountant to be prepared for cash and seek ways to shelter it. The point I would like to make is that investments come and go. The market goes up and comes down. Economies improve and crash. The world is always handing you opportunities of a lifetime, every day of your life, but all too often we fail to see them. But they are there. And the more the world changes and the more technology changes, the more opportunities there will be to allow you and your family to be financially secure for generations to come. So why bother developing your financial intelligence? Again, only you can answer that. I know why I continue to learn and develop. I do it because I know there are changes coming. I'd rather welcome change than cling to the past. I know there will be market booms and market crashes. I want to continually develop my financial intelligence because at each market change, some people will be on their knees begging for their jobs. Others, meanwhile, will take the lemons that life hands them, and we are all handed lemons occasionally, and turn them into millions. That's financial intelligence. I am often asked about the lemons I have turned into millions. I hesitate using many more examples of personal investments because I am afraid it comes across as bragging or tooting my own horn. That is not my intention. I use the examples only as numerical and chronological illustrations of actual and simple cases. I use the examples because I want you to know that it is easy. And the more familiar you become with the four pillars of financial intelligence, the easier it becomes. Personally, I use two main vehicles to achieve financial growth, real estate and small cap stocks. I use real estate as my foundation. Day in and day out, my properties provide cash flow and occasional spurts of growth and value. The small cap stocks are used for fast growth. I do not recommend anything that I do. The examples are just that, examples. If the opportunity is too complex and I do not understand the investment, I don't do it. Simple math and common sense are all you need to do well financially. There are five reasons for using examples. One, to inspire people to learn more. Two, to let people know it is easy if the foundation is strong. Three, to show that anyone can achieve great wealth. Four, to show that there are millions of ways to achieve your goals. Five, to show that it's not rocket science. In 1989, I used to jog through a lovely neighborhood in Portland, Oregon. It was a suburb that had little gingerbread houses. They were small and cute. I almost expected to see Little Red Riding Hood skipping down the sidewalk on her way to Granny's. There were for sale signs everywhere. The timber market was terrible. The stock market had just crashed, and the economy was depressed. On one street, I noticed a for sale sign that was up longer than most. It looked old. Jogging past it one day, I ran into the owner, who looked troubled. What are you asking for your house? I asked. The owner turned and smiled weakly. Make me an offer, he said. It's been for sale for over a year. Nobody even comes by anymore to look at it. I'll look, I said, and I bought the house a half hour later for $20,000 less than his asking price. It was a cute little two-bedroom home with gingerbread trim on all the windows. It was light blue with gray accents and had been built in 1930. Inside, there was a beautiful rock fireplace as well as two tiny bedrooms. It was a perfect rental house. I gave the owner $5,000 down for a $45,000 house that was really worth $65,000, except that no one wanted to buy it. The owner moved out in a week, happy to be free, and my first tenant moved in, a local college professor. After the mortgage, expenses, and management fees were paid, I put a little less than $40 in my pocket at the end of each month. 
hardly exciting. A year later, the depressed Oregon real estate market had begun to pick up. California investors, flush with money from their still booming real estate market, were moving north and buying up Oregon and Washington. I sold that little house for $95,000 to a young couple from California who thought it was a bargain. My capital gains of approximately $40,000 were placed into a 1031 tax-deferred exchange, and I went shopping for a place to put my money. In about a month, I found a 12-unit apartment house right next to the Intel plant in Beaverton, Oregon. The owners lived in Germany, had no idea what the place was worth, and again, just wanted to get out of it. I offered $275,000 for a $450,000 building. They agreed to $300,000. I bought it and held it for two years. Utilizing the same 1031 exchange process, we sold the building for $495,000 and bought a 30-unit apartment building in Phoenix, Arizona. We had moved to Phoenix by then to get out of the rain and needed to sell anyway. Like the former Oregon market, the real estate market in Phoenix was depressed. The price of the 30-unit apartment building in Phoenix was $875,000, with $225,000 down. The cash flow from the 30 units was a little over $5,000 a month. The Arizona market began moving up, and a few years later, a Colorado investor offered us $1.2 million for the property. The point of this example is how a small amount can grow into a large amount. Again, it is a matter of understanding financial statements, investment strategies, a sense of the market, and the laws. If people are not versed in these subjects, then obviously they must follow standard dogma, which is to play it safe, diversify, and only invest in secure investments. The problem with secure investments is that they are often sanitized, that is, made so safe that the gains are less. Most large brokerage houses will not touch speculative transactions in order to protect themselves and their clients, and that is a wise policy. The really hot deals are not offered to people who are novices. Often, the best deals that make the rich even richer are reserved for those who understand the game. It is technically illegal to offer speculative deals to someone who is considered not sophisticated, but of course, it happens. The more sophisticated I get, the more opportunities come my way. Another case for developing your financial intelligence over a lifetime is simply that more opportunities are presented to you. And the greater your financial intelligence, the easier it is to tell whether a deal is good. It's your intelligence that can spot a bad deal or make a bad deal good. The more I learn, and there is a lot to learn, the more money I make simply because I gain experience and wisdom as the years go on. I have friends who are playing it safe, working hard at their profession and failing to gain financial wisdom, which does take time to develop. My overall philosophy is to plant seeds inside my asset column. That is my formula. I start small and plant seeds. Some grow, some don't. Inside our real estate corporation, we have property worth several million dollars. It is our own right, or real estate investment trust. The point I'm making is that most of those millions started out as little $5,000 to $10,000 investments. All of those down payments were fortunate to catch a fast-rising market and increase tax-free. We traded in and out several times over a number of years. We also own a stock portfolio, surrounded by a corporation that Kim and I call our personal mutual fund. We have friends who deal specifically with investors like us who have extra money each month to invest. We buy high-risk, speculative private companies that are just about to go public on a stock exchange in the United States or Canada. An example of how fast gains can be made are 100,000 shares purchased for 25 cents each before the company goes public. Six months later, the company is listed, and the 100,000 shares now are worth $2 each. 
If the company is well managed, the price keeps going up, and the stock may go to $20 or more per share. There are years when our $25,000 has gone to a million in less than a year. It is not gambling if you know what you're doing. It is gambling if you are just throwing money into a deal and praying. The idea in anything is to use your technical knowledge, wisdom, and love of the game to cut the odds down, to lower the risk. Of course, there is always risk. It is financial intelligence that improves the odds. Thus, what is risky for one person is less risky to someone else. That is the primary reason I constantly encourage people to invest more in their financial education than in stocks, real estate, or other markets. The smarter you are, the better chance you have of beating the odds. The stock plays I personally invested in were extremely high risk for most people and absolutely not recommended. I have been playing that game since 1979 and have paid more than my share in dues. But if you will review why investments such as these are high risk for most people, you may be able to set your life up differently so that the ability to take $25,000 and turn it into $1 million in a year is low risk for you. As stated earlier, nothing I have written is a recommendation. It is only used as an example of what is simple and possible. What I do is small potatoes in the grand scheme of things. Yet, for the average individual, a passive income of more than $100,000 a year is nice and not hard to achieve. Depending on the market and how smart you are, it could be done in 5 to 10 years. If you keep your living expenses modest, $100,000 coming in as additional income is pleasant regardless of whether you work. You can work if you like or take time off if you choose and use the government tax system in your favor rather than against you. My personal basis is real estate. I love real estate because it's stable and slow moving. I keep the base solid. The cash flow is fairly steady and, if properly managed, has a good chance of increasing in value. The beauty of a solid base of real estate is that it allows me to take greater risks, as I do with speculative stocks. If I make great profits in the stock market, I pay my capital gains tax on the gain and then reinvest what's left in real estate, again further securing my asset foundation. A last word on real estate. I have traveled all over the world and taught investing. In every city, I hear people say you cannot buy real estate cheap. That is not my experience. Even in New York or Tokyo, or just on the outskirts of the city, prime bargains are overlooked by most people. In Singapore, with their high real estate prices, there are still bargains to be found within a short driving distance. So whenever I hear someone say, you can't do that here, pointing at me, I remind them that maybe the real statement is, I don't know how to do that here, yet. Great opportunities are not seen with your eyes. They are seen with your mind. Most people never get wealthy simply because they are not trained financially to recognize opportunities right in front of them. I am often asked, how do I start? In the final chapter of this audiobook, I offer 10 steps that I followed on the road to my financial freedom. But always remember to have fun. When you learn the rules and the vocabulary of investing and begin to build your asset column, I think you'll find that it's as fun a game as you've ever played. Sometimes you win, and sometimes you learn. But have fun. Most people never win because they're more afraid of losing. That is why I found school so silly. In school, we learn that mistakes are bad, and we are punished for making them. Yet, if you look at the way humans are designed to learn, we learn by making mistakes. We learn to walk by falling down. If we never fell down, we would never walk. The same is true for learning to ride a bike. I still have scars on my knees, but today I can ride a bike without thinking. The same is true for getting rich. 
Unfortunately, the main reason most people are not rich is because they are terrified of losing. Winners are not afraid of losing, but losers are. Failure is part of the process of success. People who avoid failure also avoid success. I look at money much like my game of tennis. I play hard, make mistakes, correct, make more mistakes, correct, and I get better. If I lose the game, I reach across the net, shake my opponent's hand, smile, and say, See you next Saturday. There are two kinds of investors. One, the first and most common type is a person who buys a packaged investment. They call a retail outlet, such as a real estate company, a stockbroker, or a financial planner, and they buy something. It could be a mutual fund, a right, a stock, or bond. It is a clean and simple way of investing. An analogy would be a shopper who goes to a computer store and buys a computer right off the shelf. Two, the second type is an investor who creates investments. This investor usually assembles a deal in the same way a person who buys components builds a computer. I do not know the first thing about putting components of a computer together, but I do know how to put pieces of opportunities together, or know people who know how. It is this second type of investor who is the more professional investor. Sometimes it may take years for all the pieces to come together, and sometimes they never do. It is this second type of investor that my rich dad encouraged me to be. It is important to learn how to put the pieces together because that is where the huge wins reside, and sometimes some huge losses if the tide goes against you. If you want to be the second type of investor, you need to develop three main skills. These skills are in addition to those required to become financially intelligent. One, find an opportunity that everyone else missed. You see with your mind what others miss with their eyes. For example, a friend bought this rundown old house. It was spooky to look at. Everyone wondered why he bought it. What he saw that we did not was that the house came with four extra empty lots. He discovered that after going to the title company. After buying the house, he tore the house down and sold the five lots to a builder for three times what he paid for the entire package. He made $75,000 for two months of work. It's not a lot of money, but it sure beats minimum wage. And it's not technically difficult. Two, raise money. The average person only goes to the bank. This second type of investor needs to know how to raise capital, and there are many ways that don't require a bank. To get started, I learned how to buy houses without a bank. It was the learned skill of raising money more than the houses themselves that was priceless. All too often, I hear people say, The bank won't lend me money, or I don't have the money to buy it. If you want to be a type 2 investor, you need to learn how to do that which stops most people. In other words, a majority of people let their lack of money stop them from making a deal. If you can avoid that obstacle, you will be millions ahead of those who don't learn those skills. There have been many times I have bought a house, a stock, or an apartment building without a penny in the bank. I once bought an apartment house for $1.2 million. I did what is called tying it up with a written contract between seller and buyer. I then raised the $100,000 deposit, which bought me 90 days to raise the rest of the money. Why did I do it? Simply because I knew it was worth $2 million. I never raised the money. Instead, the person who put up the $100,000 gave me $50,000 for finding the deal, took over my position, and I walked away. Total working time? Three days. Again, it's what you know more than what you buy. Investing is not buying. It's more a case of knowing. 3. Organize smart people. Intelligent people are those who work with or hire a person who is more intelligent than they are. 
when you need advice, make sure you choose your advisor wisely. There is a lot to learn, but the rewards can be astronomical. If you do not want to learn those skills, then being a type 1 investor is highly recommended. It is what you know that is your greatest wealth. It is what you do not know that is your greatest risk. There is always risk, so learn to manage risk instead of avoiding it. Chapter 6. Lesson 6. Work to learn. Don't work for money. Job security meant everything to my educated dad. Learning meant everything to my rich dad. A few years ago, I granted an interview with a newspaper in Singapore. The young female reporter was on time, and the interview got underway immediately. We sat in the lobby of a luxurious hotel, sipping coffee and discussing the purpose of my visit to Singapore. I was to share the platform with Zig Ziglar. He was speaking on motivation, and I was speaking on the secrets of the rich. Someday, I would like to be a best-selling author like you, she said. I had seen some of the articles she had written for the paper, and I was impressed. She had a tough, clear style of writing. Her articles held a reader's interest. You have a great style, I said in reply. What holds you back from achieving your dream? My work does not seem to go anywhere, she said quietly. Everyone says that my novels are excellent, but nothing happens. So I keep my job with the paper. At least it pays the bills. Do you have any suggestions? Yes, I do, I said brightly. A friend of mine here in Singapore runs a school that trains people to sell. He runs sales training courses for many of the top corporations here in Singapore, and I think attending one of his courses would greatly enhance your career. She stiffened. Are you saying I should go to school to learn to sell? I nodded. You aren't serious, are you? Again, I nodded. What is wrong with that? I was now backpedaling. She was offended by something, and now I was wishing I had not said anything. In my attempt to be helpful, I found myself defending my suggestion. I have a master's degree in English literature. Why would I go to school to learn to be a salesperson? I am a professional. I went to school to be trained in a profession so I would not have to be a salesperson. I hate salespeople. All they want is money. So tell me why I should study sales. She was packing her briefcase. The interview was over. On the coffee table sat a copy of an earlier best-selling book I wrote. I picked it up as well as the notes she had jotted down on her legal pad. Do you see this? I said, pointing to her notes. She looked down at her notes. What? she said, confused. Again, I pointed deliberately to her notes. On her pad she had written, Robert Kiyosaki, best-selling author. It says, best-selling author, not best-writing author, I said quietly. Her eyes widened. I am a terrible writer, I said. You are a great writer. I went to sales school. You have a master's degree. Put them together, and you get a best-selling author and a best-writing author. Anger flared from her eyes. I'll never stoop so low as to learn how to sell. People like you have no business writing. I'm a professionally trained writer, and you are a salesman. It is not fair, she fumed. She put the rest of her notes away and hurried out through the large glass doors into the humid Singapore morning. At least she gave me a fair and favorable write-up the next morning. The world is filled with smart, talented, educated, and gifted people. We meet them every day. They are all around us. A few days ago, my car was not running well. I pulled into a garage, and the young mechanic had it fixed in just a few minutes. He knew what was wrong by simply listening to the engine. I was amazed. I am constantly shocked at how little talented people earn. I have met brilliant, highly educated people who earn less than $20,000 a year. A business consultant who specializes in the medical trade was telling me how many doctors, dentists, and chiropractors struggle financially. 
all this time, I thought that when they graduated, the dollars would pour in. It was this business consultant who gave me the phrase, they are one skill away from great wealth. What this phrase means is that most people need only to learn and master one more skill, and their income would jump exponentially. I have mentioned before that financial intelligence is a synergy of accounting, investing, marketing, and law. Combine those four technical skills, and making money with money is easier than most people would believe. When it comes to money, the only skill most people know is to work hard. The classic example of a synergy of skills was that young writer for the newspaper. If she diligently learned the skills of sales and marketing, her income would jump dramatically. If I were her, I would take some courses in advertising copywriting as well as sales. Then, instead of working at the newspaper, I would seek a job at an advertising agency. Even if it were a cut in pay, she would learn how to communicate in shortcuts that are used in successful advertising. She also would spend time learning public relations, an important skill. She would learn how to get millions in free publicity. Then, at night and on weekends, she could be writing her great novel. When it was finished, she would be better able to sell her book. Then, in a short while, she could be a best-selling author. When I came out with my first book, If You Want to Be Rich and Happy, Don't Go to School, a publisher suggested I change the title to The Economics of Education. I told the publisher that, with a title like that, I would sell two books, one to my family and one to my best friend. The problem is that they would expect it for free. The obnoxious title, If You Want to Be Rich and Happy, Don't Go to School, was chosen because we knew it would get tons of publicity. I am pro-education and believe in education reform. If I were not pro-education, why would I continue to press for changing our antiquated educational system? So I chose a title that would get me on more TV and radio shows simply because I was willing to be controversial. Many people thought I was a fruitcake, but the book sold and sold. When I graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in 1969, my educated dad was happy. Standard Oil of California had hired me for its oil tanker fleet as a third mate. The pay was low compared with my classmates, but it was okay for a first real job after college. My starting pay was about $42,000 a year, including overtime, and I only had to work for seven months. I had five months of vacation. If I had wanted to, I could have taken the run to Vietnam with a subsidiary shipping company and easily doubled my pay instead of taking five months of vacation. I had a great career ahead of me, yet I resigned after six months with the company and joined the Marine Corps to learn how to fly. My educated dad was devastated. Rich dad congratulated me. In school and in the workplace, the popular opinion is the idea of specialization. That is, in order to make more money or get promoted, you need to specialize. That is why medical doctors immediately begin to seek a specialty such as orthopedics or pediatrics. The same is true for accountants, architects, lawyers, pilots, and others. My educated dad believed in the same dogma. That is why he was thrilled when he eventually achieved his doctorate. He often admitted that schools reward people who study more and more about less and less. Rich Dad encouraged me to do exactly the opposite. You want to know a little about a lot, was his suggestion. That is why for years I worked in different areas of his companies. For a while, I worked in his accounting department. Although I would probably never have been an accountant, he wanted me to learn via osmosis. Rich Dad knew I would pick up jargon and a sense of what is important and what is not. I also worked as a busboy and construction worker as well as in sales, reservations, and marketing. He was grooming Mike and me. That is why he insisted we sit in on the meetings with his bankers, lawyers, accountants, and brokers. He wanted us to know a little about every aspect of his empire. 
when I quit my high-paying job with Standard Oil, my educated dad had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with me. He was bewildered. He could not understand my decision to resign from a career that offered high pay, great benefits, lots of time off, and opportunity for promotion. When he asked me one evening, why did you quit? I could not explain it to him, though I tried hard to. My logic did not fit his logic. The big problem was that my logic was my rich dad's logic. Job security meant everything to my educated dad. Learning meant everything to my rich dad. Educated dad thought I went to school to learn to be a ship's officer. Rich dad knew that I went to school to study international trade. So, as a student, I made cargo runs, navigating large freighters, oil tankers, and passenger ships to the Far East and the South Pacific. Rich Dad emphasized that I should stay in the Pacific instead of taking ships to Europe because he knew that the emerging nations were in Asia, not Europe. While most of my classmates, including Mike, were partying at their fraternity houses, I was studying trade, people, business styles, and cultures in Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Korea, Tahiti, Samoa, and the Philippines. I was partying also, but it was not in any frat house. I grew up rapidly. Educated Dad just could not understand why I decided to quit and join the Marine Corps. I told him I wanted to learn to fly, but really, I wanted to learn to lead troops. Rich Dad explained to me that the hardest part of running a company is managing people. He had spent three years in the Army. My educated dad was draft-exempt. Rich Dad valued learning to lead men into dangerous situations. Leadership is what you need to learn next, he said. If you're not a good leader, you'll get shot in the back, just like they do in business. Returning from Vietnam in 1973, I resigned my commission, even though I loved flying. I found a job with Xerox Corporation. I joined it for one reason, and it was not for the benefits. I was a shy person, and the thought of selling was the most frightening subject in the world. Xerox has one of the best sales training programs in America. Rich Dad was proud of me. My educated dad was ashamed. Being an intellectual, he thought that salespeople were below him. I worked with Xerox for four years until I overcame my fear of knocking on doors and being rejected. Once I could consistently be in the top five in sales, I again resigned and moved on, leaving behind another great career with an excellent company. In 1977, I formed my first company. Rich Dad had groomed Mike and me to take over companies, so I now had to learn to form them and put them together. My first product, the nylon and Velcro wallet, was manufactured in the Far East and shipped to a warehouse in New York, near where I had gone to school. My formal education was complete, and it was time to test my wings. If I failed, I would go broke. Rich Dad thought it best to go broke before 30. You still have time to recover, was his advice. On the eve of my 30th birthday, my first shipment left Korea for New York. Today, I still do business internationally, and as my rich dad encouraged me to do, I keep seeking the emerging nations. Today, my investment company invests in South American countries and Asian countries, as well as in Norway and Russia. There is an old cliché that goes, job is an acronym for just over broke. Unfortunately, I would say that applies to millions of people. Because school does not think financial intelligence is an intelligence, most workers live within their means. They work and they pay bills. There is another horrible management theory that goes, workers work hard enough to not be fired, and owners pay just enough so that workers won't quit. And if you look at the pay scales of most companies, again, I would say there is a degree of truth to that statement. The net result is that most workers never get ahead. They do what they've been taught to do, get a secure job. 
most workers focus on working for pay and benefits that reward them in the short term, but are often disastrous in the long run. Instead, I recommend to young people to seek work for what they will learn more than what they will earn. Look down the road at what skills they want to acquire before choosing a specific profession and before getting trapped in the rat race. Once people are trapped in the lifelong process of bill paying, they become like those little hamsters running around in those metal wheels. Their little furry legs are spinning furiously. The wheel is turning furiously. But come tomorrow morning, they'll still be in the same cage. Great job. In the movie Jerry Maguire, starring Tom Cruise, there are many great one liners. Probably the most memorable is Show Me the Money. But there is one line I thought most truthful. It comes from the scene where Tom Cruise is leaving the firm. He has just been fired, and he is asking the entire company, Who wants to come with me? And the whole place is silent and frozen. Only one woman speaks up and says, I'd like to, but I'm due for a promotion in three months. That statement is probably the most truthful statement in the whole movie. It is the type of statement that people use to keep themselves busy, working away to pay bills. I know my educated dad looked forward to his pay raise every year, and every year he was disappointed. So he would go back to school to earn more qualifications so he could get another raise. Then, once again, there would be another disappointment. The question I often ask people is, where is this daily activity taking you? Just like the little hamster, I wonder if people look at where their hard work is taking them. What does the future hold? In his book, The Retirement Myth, Craig S. Carpel writes, I visited the headquarters of a major national pension consulting firm and met with a managing director who specializes in designing lush retirement plans for top management. When I asked her what people who don't have corner offices will be able to expect in the way of pension income, she said with a confident smile, the silver bullet. What, I asked, is the silver bullet? She shrugged and said, if baby boomers discover they don't have enough money to live on when they're older, they can always blow their brains out. Carpel goes on to explain the difference between the old defined benefit retirement plans and the new 401k plans that are riskier. It is not a pretty picture for most people working today, and that is just for retirement. Add medical fees and long-term nursing home care, and the picture is frightening. Already, many hospitals in countries with socialized medicine need to make tough decisions such as who will live and who will die. They make those decisions purely on how much money they have and how old the patients are. If the patient is old, they often will give the medical care to someone younger. The older, poor patient gets put to the back of the line. Just as the rich can afford better education, the rich will be able to keep themselves alive, while those who have little wealth will die. So, I wonder... Are workers looking into the future or just until their next paycheck, never questioning where they are headed? When I speak to adults who want to earn more money, I always recommend the same thing. I suggest taking a long view of their life. Instead of simply working for the money and security, which I admit are important, I suggest they take a second job that will teach them a second skill. Often I recommend joining a network marketing company, also called multi-level marketing, if they want to learn sales skills. Some of these companies have excellent training programs that help people get over their fear of failure and rejection, which are the main reasons people are unsuccessful. Education is more valuable than money in the long run. When I offer this suggestion, I often hear in response, Oh, that is too much hassle or I only want to do what I am interested in. If they say, it's too much of a hassle, I ask, so you would rather work all your life giving 50% of what you earn to the government? If they tell me, I only do what I am interested in, 
I say, I'm not interested in going to the gym, but I go because I want to feel better and live longer. Unfortunately, there is some truth to the old statement, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Unless a person is used to changing, it's hard to change. But for those of you who might be on the fence when it comes to the idea of working to learn something new, I offer this word of encouragement. Life is much like going to the gym. The most painful part is deciding to go. Once you get past that, it's easy. There have been many days I have dreaded going to the gym, but once I am there and in motion, it is a pleasure. After the workout is over, I am always glad I talked myself into going. If you are unwilling to work to learn something new and instead insist on becoming highly specialized within your field, make sure the company you work for is unionized. Labor unions are designed to protect specialists. My educated dad, after falling from grace with the governor, became the head of the teachers union in Hawaii. He told me that it was the hardest job he ever held. My rich dad, on the other hand, spent his life doing his best to keep his companies from becoming unionized. He was successful. Although the unions came close, rich dad was always able to fight them off. Personally, I take no sides because I can see the need for and the benefits of both sides. If you do as school recommends, become highly specialized, then seek union protection. For example, had I continued with my flying career, I would have sought a company that had a strong pilot's union. Why? Because my life would be dedicated to learning a skill that was valuable in only one industry. If I were pushed out of that industry, my life's skills would not be as valuable to another industry. A displaced senior pilot with 100,000 hours of heavy airline transport time, earning $150,000 a year, would have a hard time finding an equivalent high-paying job teaching in school. Skills do not necessarily transfer from industry to industry. Skills the pilots are paid for in the airline industry are not as important in, say, the school system. The same is true even for doctors today. With all the changes in medicine, many medical specialists are needing to conform to medical organizations such as HMOs. School teachers definitely need to be union members. Today in America, the teachers' union is the largest and the richest labor union of all. The NEA, the National Education Association, has tremendous political clout. Teachers need the protection of their union because their skills are also of limited value to an industry outside of education. So the rule of thumb is highly specialized, then unionize. It's the smart thing to do. When I ask the classes I teach, how many of you can cook a better hamburger than McDonald's, almost all the students raise their hands. I then ask, so if most of you can cook a better hamburger, how come McDonald's makes more money than you? The answer is obvious. McDonald's is excellent at business systems. The reason so many talented people are poor is because they focus on building a better hamburger and know little to nothing about business systems. A friend of mine in Hawaii is a great artist. He makes a sizable amount of money. One day, his mother's attorney called to tell him that she had left him $35,000. That is what was left of her estate after the attorney and the government took their shares. Immediately, he saw an opportunity to increase his business by using some of this money to advertise. Two months later, his first four-color full-page ad appeared in an expensive magazine that targeted the very rich. The ad ran for three months. He received no replies from the ad, and all of his inheritance is now gone. He now wants to sue the magazine for misrepresentation. This is a common case of someone who can build a beautiful hamburger but knows little about business. When I asked him what he learned, his only reply was, advertising salespeople are crooks. I then asked him if he would be willing to take a course in sales and a course in direct marketing. His reply, 
I don't have the time, and I don't want to waste my money. The world is filled with talented poor people. All too often, they're poor or struggle financially or earn less than they are capable of, not because of what they know, but because of what they do not know. They focus on perfecting their skills at building a better hamburger rather than the skills of selling and delivering the hamburger. Maybe McDonald's does not make the best hamburger, but they are the best at selling and delivering a basic average burger. Poor Dad wanted me to specialize. That was his view on how to be paid more. Even after being told by the governor of Hawaii that he could no longer work in state government, my educated dad continued to encourage me to get specialized. Educated dad then took up the cause of the teachers' union, campaigning for further protection and benefits for these highly skilled and educated professionals. We argued often, but I know he never agreed that over-specialization is what caused the need for union protection. He never understood that the more specialized you become, the more you are trapped and dependent on that specialty. Rich Dad advised that Mike and I groom ourselves. Many corporations do the same thing. They find a young, bright student just out of business school and begin grooming that person to someday take over the company. So these bright young employees do not specialize in one department. They are moved from department to department to learn all the aspects of business systems. The rich often groom their children or the children of others. By doing so, their children gain an overall knowledge of the operations of the business and how the various departments interrelate. For the World War II generation, it was considered bad to skip from company to company. Today, it is considered smart. Since people will skip from company to company rather than seek greater specialization in skills, why not seek to learn more than to earn? In the short term, it may earn you less, but it will pay dividends in the long term. The main management skills needed for success are 1. Management of cash flow 2. Management of systems 3. Management of people the most important specialized skills are sales and marketing. The ability to sell, to communicate to another human being, be it a customer, employee, boss, spouse, or child, is the base skill of personal success. Communication skills such as writing, speaking, and negotiating are crucial to a life of success. These are skills I work on constantly, attending courses or buying educational resources to expand my knowledge. As I have mentioned, my educated dad worked harder and harder the more competent he became. He also became more trapped the more specialized he got. Although his salary went up, his choices diminished. Soon after he was locked out of government work, he found out how vulnerable he really was professionally. It is like professional athletes who suddenly are injured or are too old to play. Their once high-paying position is gone, and they have limited skills to fall back on. I think that is why my educated dad sided so much with the unions after that. He realized how much a union would have benefited him. Rich Dad encouraged Mike and me to know a little about a lot. He encouraged us to work with people smarter than we were and to bring smart people together to work as a team. Today, it would be called a synergy of professional specialties. Today, I meet ex-school teachers earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They earn that much because they have specialized skills in their field as well as other skills. They can teach as well as sell and market. I know of no other skills to be more important than selling and marketing. The skills of selling and marketing are difficult for most people, primarily due to their fear of rejection. The better you are at communicating, negotiating, and handling your fear of rejection, the easier life is. Just as I advise that newspaper writer who wanted to become a best-selling author, I advise anyone else today. Being technically specialized has its strengths as well as its weaknesses. I have friends who are geniuses, but they cannot communicate effectively with other human beings and, as a result, their earnings are pitiful. 
I advise them to just spend a year learning to sell. Even if they earn nothing, their communication skills will improve, and that is priceless. In addition to being good learners, sellers, and marketers, we need to be good teachers as well as good students. To be truly rich, we need to be able to give as well as to receive. In cases of financial or professional struggle, there is often a lack of giving and receiving. I know many people who are poor because they are neither good students nor good teachers. Both of my dads were generous men. Both made it a practice to give first. Teaching was one of their ways of giving. The more they gave, the more they received. One glaring difference was in the giving of money. My rich dad gave lots of money away. He gave to his church, to charities, and to his foundation. He knew that to receive money, you had to give money. Giving money is the secret to most great wealthy families. That is why there are organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation. These are organizations designed to take their wealth and increase it, as well as give it away in perpetuity. My educated dad always said, when I have some extra money, I'll give it. The problem was that there was never any extra. So he worked harder to draw more money in, rather than focus on the most important law of money. Give, and you shall receive. Instead, he believed in, receive, and then you give. In conclusion, I became both dads. One part of me is a hardcore capitalist who loves the game of money making money. The other part is a socially responsible teacher who is deeply concerned with this ever-widening gap between the haves and have-nots. I personally hold the archaic educational system primarily responsible for this growing gap. Chapter 7. Overcoming Obstacles the primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage fear. Once people have studied and become financially literate, they may still face roadblocks to becoming financially independent. There are five main reasons why financially literate people may still not develop abundant asset columns that could produce a large cash flow. The five reasons are 1. Fear 2. Cynicism 3. Laziness 4. Bad Habits 5. Arrogance Overcoming Fear I have never met anyone who really likes losing money. And in all my years, I have never met a rich person who has never lost money. But I have met a lot of poor people who have never lost a dime. Investing, that is. The fear of losing money is real. Everyone has it, even the rich. But it's not having fear that is the problem. It's how you handle fear. It's how you handle losing. It's how you handle failure that makes the difference in one's life. The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage that fear. It's okay to be fearful. It's okay to be a coward when it comes to money. You can still be rich. We're all heroes at something and cowards at something else. My friend's wife is an emergency room nurse. When she sees blood, she flies into action. When I mention investing, she runs away. When I see blood, I don't run. I pass out. My rich dad understood phobias about money. Some people are terrified of snakes. Some people are terrified about losing money. Both are phobias, he would say. So his solution to the phobia of losing money was this little rhyme. If you hate risk and worry, start early. If you start young, it's easier to be rich. I won't go into it here, but there is a staggering difference between a person who starts investing at age 20 versus age 30. The purchase of Manhattan Island is said to be one of the greatest bargains of all time. New York was purchased for $24 in trinkets and beads. Yet, if that $24 had been invested at 8% annually, that $24 would have been worth more than $28 trillion by 1995. 
Manhattan could be repurchased with money left over to buy much of Los Angeles. But what if you don't have much time left or would like to retire early? How do you handle the fear of losing money? My poor dad did nothing. He simply avoided the issue, refusing to discuss the subject. My rich dad, on the other hand, recommended that I think like a Texan. I like Texas and Texans, he used to say. In Texas, everything is bigger. When Texans win, they win big. And when they lose, it's spectacular. They like losing? I asked. That's not what I'm saying. Nobody likes losing. Show me a happy loser, and I'll show you a loser, said Rich Dad. It's a Texan's attitude toward risk, reward, and failure I'm talking about. It's how they handle life. They live it big. Not like most of the people around here, living like roaches when it comes to money, terrified that someone will shine a light on them, and whimpering when the grocery clerk shortchanges them a quarter. Rich Dad went on. What I like best is the Texas attitude. They're proud when they win, and they brag when they lose. Texans have a saying, if you're going to go broke, go big. You don't want to admit you went broke over a duplex. He constantly told Mike and me that the greatest reason for lack of financial success was because most people played it too safe. People are so afraid of losing that they lose, were his words. Fran Tarkenton, a one-time great NFL quarterback, says it still another way. Winning means being unafraid to lose. In my own life, I've noticed that winning usually follows losing. Before I finally learned to ride a bike, I first fell down many times. I've never met a golfer who has never lost a golf ball. I've never met people who have fallen in love who have never had their heart broken. And I've never met someone rich who has never lost money. So for most people, the reason they don't win financially is because the pain of losing money is far greater than the joy of being rich. Another saying in Texas is, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Most people dream of being rich, but are terrified of losing money, so they never get to heaven. Rich Dad used to tell Mike and me stories about his trips to Texas. If you really want to learn the attitude of how to handle risk, losing, and failure, go to San Antonio and visit the Alamo. The Alamo is a great story of brave people who chose to fight, knowing there was no hope of success. They chose to die instead of surrendering. It's an inspiring story worthy of study. Nonetheless, it's still a tragic military defeat. They got their butts kicked. So, how do Texans handle failure? They still shout, Remember the Alamo. Mike and I heard this story a lot. He always told us this story when he was about to go into a big deal and he was nervous. After he had done all his due diligence and it was time to put up or shut up, he told us this story. Every time he was afraid of making a mistake or losing money, he told us this story. It gave him strength, for it reminded him that he could always turn a financial loss into a financial win. Rich Dad knew that failure would only make him stronger and smarter. It's not that he wanted to lose. He just knew who he was and how he would take a loss. He would take a loss and make it a win. That's what made him a winner and others losers. It gave him the courage to cross the line when others backed out. That's why I like Texans so much, he would say. They took a great failure and turned it into inspiration, as well as a tourist destination that makes them millions. But probably his words that mean the most to me today are these. Texans don't bury their failures. They get inspired by them. They take their failures and turn them into rallying cries. Failure inspires Texans to become winners. But that formula is not just the formula for Texans. It is the formula for all winners. I've said that falling off my bike was part of learning to ride. I remember falling off only made me more determined to learn to ride, not less.
I also said that I have never met a golfer who has never lost a ball. For top professional golfers, losing a ball or a tournament provides the inspiration to be better, to practice harder, to study more. That's what makes them better. For winners, losing inspires them. For losers, losing defeats them. I like to quote John D. Rockefeller, who said, I always tried to turn every disaster into an opportunity. And being Japanese American, I can say this. Many people say that Pearl Harbor was an American mistake. I say it was a Japanese mistake. From the movie Tora, 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 a somber Japanese admiral says to his cheering subordinates, I am afraid we have awakened a sleeping giant. Remember Pearl Harbor became a rallying cry. It turned one of America's greatest losses into the reason to win. This great defeat gave America strength, and America soon emerged as a world power. Failure inspires winners, and failure defeats losers. It is the biggest secret of winners. It's the secret that losers do not know. The greatest secret of winners is that failure inspires winning. Thus, they're not afraid of losing. Repeating Fran Tarkenton's quote, winning means being unafraid to lose. People like Fran Tarkenton are not afraid of losing because they know who they are. They hate losing, so they know that losing will only inspire them to become better. There is a big difference between hating losing and being afraid to lose. Most people are so afraid of losing money that they lose. They go broke over a duplex. Financially, they play life too safe and too small. They buy big houses and big cars, but not big investments. The main reason that over 90% of the American public struggles financially is because they play not to lose. They don't play to win. They go to their financial planners or accountants or stockbrokers and buy a balanced portfolio. Most have lots of cash and CDs, low-yield bonds, mutual funds that can be traded within a mutual fund family, and a few individual stocks. It is a safe and sensible portfolio, but it is not a winning portfolio. It is a portfolio of someone playing not to lose. Don't get me wrong, it's probably a better portfolio than more than 70% of the population has, and that's frightening. It's a great portfolio for someone who loves safety. But playing it safe and balanced on your investment portfolio is not the way successful investors play the game. If you have little money and you want to be rich, you must first be focused, not balanced. If you look at any successful person, at the start, they were not balanced. Balanced people go nowhere. They stay in one spot. To make progress, you must first go unbalanced. Just look at how you make progress walking. Thomas Edison was not balanced. He was focused. Bill Gates was not balanced. He was focused. Donald Trump is focused. George Soros is focused. George Patton did not take his tanks wide. He focused them and blew through the weak spots in the German line. The French went wide with the Maginot line, and you know what happened to them. If you have any desire to be rich, you must focus. Do not do what poor and middle-class people do. Put their few eggs in many baskets. Put a lot of your eggs in a few baskets and focus. Follow one course until successful. If you hate losing, play it safe. If losing makes you weak, play it safe. Go with balanced investments. If you're over 25 years old and are terrified of taking risks, don't change. Play it safe, but start early. Start accumulating your nest egg early because it will take time. But if you have dreams of freedom, of getting out of the rat race, the first question to ask yourself is, how do I respond to failure? If failure inspires you to win, maybe you should go for it, but only maybe. If failure makes you weak or causes you to throw temper tantrums, like spoiled brats who call attorneys to file lawsuits every time something doesn't go their way, then play it safe. Keep your daytime job or buy bonds or mutual funds. 
But remember, there is risk in those financial instruments also, even though they may appear safe. I say all this, mentioning Texas and Fran Tarkenton, because stacking the asset column is easy. It's really a low aptitude game. It doesn't take much education. Fifth grade math will do. But building your asset column is a game in which attitude plays a major role. It takes guts, patience, and a great attitude toward failure. Losers avoid failing, and failure turns losers into winners. Just remember the Alamo. Overcoming Cynicism The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Most of us know the story of Chicken Little who ran around warning the barnyard of impending doom. We all know people who are that way. There's a Chicken Little inside each of us. As I stated earlier, the cynic is really a little chicken. We all get a little chicken when fear and doubt cloud our thoughts. All of us have doubts. I'm not smart. I'm not good enough. So-and-so is better than me. Our doubts often paralyze us. We play the what-if game. What if the economy crashes right after I invest? What if I lose control and I can't pay the money back? What if things don't go as I planned? Or we have friends or loved ones who will remind us of our shortcomings. They often say, what makes you think you can do that? If it's such a good idea, how come someone else hasn't done it? That will never work. You don't know what you're talking about. These words of doubt often get so loud that we fail to act. A horrible feeling builds in our stomach. Sometimes we can't sleep. We fail to move forward. So we stay with what is safe, and opportunities pass us by. We watch life passing by as we sit immobilized with a cold knot in our body. We have all felt this at one time in our lives, some more than others. Peter Lynch, of Fidelity Magellan Mutual Fund fame, refers to warnings about the sky falling as noise, and we all hear it. Noise is either created inside our heads or comes from outside, often from friends, family, co-workers, and the media. Lynch recalls the time during the 1950s when the threat of nuclear war was so prevalent in the news that people began building fallout shelters and storing food and water. If they had invested that money wisely in the market, instead of building a fallout shelter, they'd probably be financially independent today. When violence breaks out in a city, gun sales go up all over the country. A person dies from rare hamburger meat in the state of Washington, and the Arizona Health Department orders restaurants to have all beef cooked well done. A drug company runs a TV commercial in February showing people catching the flu. Colds go up as well as sales of cold medicine. Most people are poor because when it comes to investing, the world is filled with chicken littles running around yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And chicken littles are effective because every one of us is a little chicken. It often takes great courage to not let rumors and talk of doom and gloom affect your doubts and fears. But a savvy investor knows that the seemingly worst of times is actually the best of times to make money. When everyone else is too afraid to act, they pull the trigger and are rewarded. Some time ago, a friend named Richard came from Boston to visit Kim and me in Phoenix. He was impressed with what we had done through stocks and real estate. The Phoenix real estate prices were depressed. We spent two days showing him what we thought were excellent opportunities for cash flow and capital appreciation. Kim and I are not real estate agents. We are strictly investors. After identifying a unit in a resort community, we called an agent who sold it to him that afternoon. The price was a mere $42,000 for a two-bedroom townhome. Similar units were going for $65,000. He had found a bargain. Excited, he bought it and returned to Boston. Two weeks later, the agent called to say that our friend had backed out. I called immediately to find out why. All he said was that he talked to his neighbor, and his neighbor told him it was a bad deal. He was paying too much. I asked Richard if his neighbor was an investor. 
Richard said he was not. When I asked why he listened to him, Richard got defensive and simply said he wanted to keep looking. The real estate market in Phoenix turned, and a few years later, that little unit was renting for $1,000 a month, $2,500 in the peak winter months. The unit was worth $95,000. All Richard had to put down was $5,000, and he would have had a start at getting out of the rat race. Today, he still has done nothing. Richard's backing out did not surprise me. It's called buyer's remorse, and it affects all of us. The little chicken won, and a chance at freedom was lost. In another example, I hold a small portion of my assets in tax lien certificates instead of CDs. I earn 16% per year on my money, which certainly beats the interest rates banks offer on CDs. The certificates are secured by real estate and enforced by state law which is also better than most banks. The formula they're bought on makes them safe. They just lack liquidity. So I look at them as two- to seven-year CDs. Almost every time I tell someone that I hold my money this way, especially if they have money in CDs, they will tell me it's risky. They tell me why I should not do it. When I ask them where they get their information, they say from a friend or an investment magazine. They've never done it, and they're telling someone who's doing it why they shouldn't. The lowest yield I look for is 16%, but people who are filled with doubt are willing to accept a far lower return. Doubt is expensive. My point is that it's those doubts and cynicism that keep most people poor and playing it safe. The real world is simply waiting for you to get rich. Only a person's doubts keep them poor. As I said, getting out of the rat race is technically easy. It doesn't take much education, but those doubts are cripplers for most people. Cynics never win, said Rich Dad. Unchecked doubt and fear creates a cynic. Cynics criticize and winners analyze was another of his favorite sayings. Rich Dad explained that criticism blinded while analysis opened eyes. Analysis allowed winners to see that critics were blind and to see opportunities that everyone else missed. And finding what people miss is key to any success. Real estate is a powerful investment tool for anyone seeking financial independence or freedom. It is a unique investment tool. Yet every time I mention real estate as a vehicle, I often hear, I don't want to fix toilets. That's what Peter Lynch calls noise. That's what my rich dad would say is the cynic talking, someone who criticizes and does not analyze, someone who lets their doubts and fears close their mind instead of open their eyes. So when someone says, I don't want to fix toilets, I want to fire back, what makes you think I want to? They're saying a toilet is more important than what they want. I talk about freedom from the rat race, and they focus on toilets. That is the thought pattern that keeps most people poor. They criticize instead of analyze. I don't want hold the key to your success, Rich Dad would say, because I, too, do not want to fix toilets. I shop hard for a property manager who does fix toilets. And by finding a great property manager who runs houses or apartments, well, my cash flow goes up. But more importantly, a great property manager allows me to buy a lot more real estate since I don't have to fix toilets. A great property manager is key to success in real estate. Finding a good manager is more important to me than the real estate. A great property manager often hears of great deals before real estate agents do, which makes them even more valuable. That is what Rich Dad meant by... I don't once hold the key to your success. Because I do not want to fix toilets either, I figured out how to buy more real estate and expedite my getting out of the rat race. The people who continue to say, I don't want to fix toilets, often deny themselves the use of this powerful investment vehicle. Toilets are more important than their freedom. In the stock market, I often hear people say, I don't want to lose money. Well, what makes them think I or anyone else likes losing money? They don't make money because they choose to not lose money.
Instead of analyzing, they closed their minds to another powerful investment vehicle, the stock market. I was riding with a friend past our neighborhood gas station. He looked up and saw that the price of gas was going up and thus the price of oil. My friend is a worry ward or a chicken little. To him, the sky is always going to fall, and it usually does, on him. When we got home, he showed me all the stats as to why the price of oil was going to go up over the next few years, statistics I had never seen before, even though I already owned substantial shares of an existing oil company. With that information, I immediately began looking for and found a new undervalued oil company that was about to find some oil deposits. My broker was excited about this new company, and I bought 15,000 shares for 65 cents per share. Three months later, this same friend and I drove by the same gas station, and sure enough, the price per gallon had gone up nearly 15%. Again, the chicken little worried and complained. I smiled, because a month earlier, that little oil company hit oil, and those 15,000 shares went up to more than $3 per share since he had first given me the tip. And the price of gas will continue to go up if what my friend says is true. If most people understood how a stop worked in stock market investing, there would be more people investing to win instead of investing not to lose. A stop is simply a computer command that sells your stock automatically if the price begins to drop, helping to minimize your losses and maximize some gains. It's a great tool for those who are terrified of losing. So whenever I hear people focusing on their I don't wants rather than what they do want, I know the noise in their head must be loud. Chicken Little has taken over their brain and is yelling, the sky is falling and toilets are breaking. So they avoid their don't wants, but they pay a huge price. They may never get what they want in life. Instead of analyzing, their inner Chicken Little closes their mind. Rich Dad gave me a way of looking at Chicken Little. Just do what Colonel Sanders did. At the age of 66, he lost his business and began to live on his Social Security check. It wasn't enough. He went around the country selling his recipe for fried chicken. He was turned down 1,009 times before someone said yes, and he went on to become a multimillionaire at an age when most people are quitting. He was a brave and tenacious man, Rich Dad said of Harlan Sanders. So when you're in doubt and feeling a little afraid, just do what Colonel Sanders did to his little chicken. He fried it. Overcoming laziness. Busy people are often the most lazy. We have all heard stories of a businessman who works hard to earn money. He works hard to be a good provider for his wife and children. He spends long hours at the office and brings work home on weekends. One day he comes home to an empty house. His wife has left with the kids. He knew he and his wife had problems, but rather than work to make the relationship strong, he stayed busy at work. Dismayed, his performance at work slips and he loses his job. Today, I often meet people who are too busy to take care of their wealth, and there are people too busy to take care of their health. The cause is the same. They're busy, and they stay busy as a way of avoiding something they do not want to face. Nobody has to tell them. Deep down, they know. In fact, if you remind them, they often respond with anger or irritation. If they aren't busy at work or with the kids, they're often busy watching TV, fishing, playing golf, or shopping. Yet, deep down, they know they are avoiding something important. That's the most common form of laziness. Laziness by staying busy. So, what is the cure for laziness? The answer is a little greed. For many of us, we were raised thinking of greed or desire as bad. Greedy people are bad people, my mom used to say, yet we all have inside of us this yearning to have nice, new, or exciting things. So to keep that emotion of desire under control, often parents find ways of suppressing that desire with guilt. You only think about yourself. Don't you know you have brothers and sisters? Was one of my mom's favorites. 
you want me to buy you what? Was a favorite of my dad. Do you think we're made of money? Do you think money grows on trees? We're not rich people, you know. It wasn't so much the words, but the angry guilt trip that went with the words that got to me. Or the reverse guilt trip was the, I'm sacrificing my life to buy this for you. I'm buying this for you because I never had this advantage when I was a kid. I have a neighbor who is stone broke but can't park his car in his garage. The garage is filled with toys for his kids. Those spoiled brats get everything they ask for. I don't want them to know the feeling of want are his everyday words. He has nothing set aside for their college or his retirement, but his kids have every toy ever made. He recently got a new credit card in the mail and took his kids to visit Las Vegas. I'm doing it for the kids, he said with great sacrifice. Rich Dad forbade the words, I can't afford it. In my real home, that's all I heard. Instead, Rich Dad required his children to say, How can I afford it? He believed that the words, I can't afford it, shut down your brain. It didn't have to think anymore. How can I afford it opened up the brain and forced it to think and search for answers. But most importantly, he felt the words, I can't afford it, were a lie. And the human spirit knows it. The human spirit is very, very powerful, he would say. It knows it can do anything. By having a lazy mind that says, I can't afford it, a war breaks out inside you. Your spirit is angry, and your lazy mind must defend its lie. The spirit is screaming, Come on, let's go to the gym and work out. And the lazy mind says, But I'm tired. I worked really hard today. Or the human spirit says, I'm sick and tired of being poor. Let's get out there and get rich. To which the lazy mind says, Rich people are greedy. Besides, it's too much bother. It's not safe. I might lose money. I'm working hard enough as it is. I've got too much to do at work anyway. Look at what I have to do tonight. My boss wants it finished by morning. I can't afford it also causes sadness, a helplessness that leads to despondency and often depression. How can I afford it opens up possibilities, excitement, and dreams. So Rich Dad was not so concerned about what we wanted to buy as long as we understood that how can I afford it creates a stronger mind and a dynamic spirit. Thus, he rarely gave Mike or me anything. He would instead ask, how can you afford it? And that included college, which we paid for ourselves. It was not the goal, but the process of attaining the goal that he wanted us to learn. The problem I see today is that there are millions of people who feel guilty about their desire or their greed. It's old conditioning from their childhood. While they desire to have the finer things that life offers, most have been conditioned subconsciously to say, I can't have that, or I'll never be able to afford that. When I decided to exit the rat race, it was simply a question of how can I afford to never work again? And my mind began to kick out answers and solutions. The hardest part was fighting my real parents' dogma. We can't afford that. Stop thinking only about yourself. Why don't you think about others? and other similar sentiments designed to instill guilt to suppress my greed. So, how do you beat laziness? Once again, the answer is a little greed. It's that radio station, WIIFM, which stands for What's In It For Me. A person needs to sit down and ask, What would my life be like if I never had to work again? What would I do if I had all the money I needed? Without that little greed, the desire to have something better, progress is not made. Our world progresses because we all desire a better life. New inventions are made because we desire something better. We go to school and study hard because we want something better. So whenever you find yourself avoiding something you know you should be doing, then the only thing to ask yourself is, what's in it for me? Be a little greedy. It's the best cure for laziness. Too much greed, however, as anything in excess can be, is not good. 
But just remember what Michael Douglas said in the movie Wall Street. Greed is good. Rich Dad said it differently. Guilt is worse than greed, for guilt robs the body of its soul. I think Eleanor Roosevelt said it best. Do what you feel in your heart to be right, for you'll be criticized anyway. You'll be damned if you do, and damned if you don't. Overcoming Bad Habits Our lives are a reflection of our habits more than our education. After seeing the movie Conan the Barbarian, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, a friend said, I'd love to have a body like Schwarzenegger. Most of the guys nodded in agreement. I even heard he was really puny and skinny at one time, another friend added. Yeah, I heard that too, another one said. I heard he has a habit of working out almost every day in the gym. Yeah, I'll bet he has to. Nah, said the group cynic. I'll bet he was born that way. Besides, let's stop talking about Arnold and get some beers. This is an example of habits controlling behavior. I remember asking my rich dad about the habits of the rich. Instead of answering me outright, he wanted me to learn through example, as usual. When does your dad pay his bills? Rich dad asked. The first of the month, I said. Does he have anything left over? He asked. Very little, I said. That's the main reason he struggles, said Rich Dad. He has bad habits. Your dad pays everyone else first. He pays himself last, but only if he has anything left over. Which he usually doesn't, I said. But he has to pay his bills, doesn't he? You're saying he shouldn't pay his bills? Of course not, said Rich Dad. I firmly believe in paying my bills on time. I just pay myself first, before I pay even the government. But what happens if you don't have enough money, I asked. What do you do then? The same, said Rich Dad. I still pay myself first, even if I'm short of money. My asset column is far more important to me than the government. But, I said, don't they come after you? Yes, if you don't pay, said Rich Dad. Look, I did not say not to pay. I just said I pay myself first, even if I'm short of money. But, I replied, how do you do that? It's not how. The question is why, Rich Dad said. Okay, why? Motivation, said Rich Dad. Who do you think will complain louder if I don't pay them? Me or my creditors? Your creditors will definitely scream louder than you, I said, responding to the obvious. You wouldn't say anything if you didn't pay yourself. So you see, after paying myself, the pressure to pay my taxes and the other creditors is so great that it forces me to seek other forms of income. The pressure to pay becomes my motivation. I've worked extra jobs, started other companies, traded in the stock market, anything, just to make sure those guys don't start yelling at me. That pressure made me work harder, forced me to think, and all in all, made me smarter and more active when it comes to money. If I had paid myself last, I would have felt no pressure, but I'd be broke. So it is the fear of the government or other people you owe money to that motivates you? That's right, said Rich Dad. You see, government bill collectors are big bullies. So are bill collectors in general. Most people give in to those bullies. They pay them and never pay themselves. You know the story of the 98-pound weakling who gets sand kicked in his face? I nodded. I see that ad for weightlifting and bodybuilding lessons in the comic books all the time. Well, most people let the bullies kick sand in their faces. I decided to use the fear of the bully to make me stronger. Others got weaker. Forcing myself to think about how to make extra money is like going to the gym and working out with weights. The more I work my mental money muscles out, the stronger I get. Now, I'm not afraid of those bullies. I liked what Rich Dad was saying, so if I pay myself first, I get financially stronger mentally and fiscally. Rich Dad nodded. And if I pay myself last, or not at all, I get weaker. So people like bosses, managers, tax collectors, bill collectors, and landlords push me around all my life just because I don't have good money habits. Rich Dad nodded, just like the 98-pound weakling. 
Overcoming arrogance. What I know makes me money. What I don't know loses me money. Every time I have been arrogant, I have lost money. Because when I'm arrogant, I truly believe that what I don't know is not important, Rich Dad would often tell me. I have found that many people use arrogance to try to hide their own ignorance. It often happens when I am discussing financial statements with accountants or even other investors. They try to bluster their way through the discussion. It is clear to me that they don't know what they're talking about. They're not lying, but they are not telling the truth. There are many people in the world of money, finances, and investments who have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Most people in the money industry are just spouting off sales pitches like used car salesmen. When you know 